Kiora, Malolulei, Talufalava. Shalom, Salam Alikum. Greetings, brothers and sisters. The solution to the economic and social challenges we face as a nation is not to be found in the construction of four-lane expressways, nor the drilling of tunnels under hills and mountain ranges. In my respectful view, the most cost-effective solution to these multiple challenges is to be found in the construction of a massive number of new houses by the state for the most vulnerable members of our team, which of course includes our children living in inequality. These houses must meet three criteria, conveniently summarised in the acronym SAS, safe, affordable, secure. Safe meaning fit for the purpose of providing a dignified shelter for family units. Affordable in that the cost to the families must be not so overwhelming that access to other basic human necessities, food, education and health is compromised. Secure. They must be secure in the sense that the shelter offered must be in some form offering long-term stability, whether it be tenancy, rent to buy, shared e e equity. A suite of options are necessary. But these nuts and bolts issues can be for analysis and discussion and debate at another time. Today, I wish to address, as it were, the big picture. I start off with this basic proposition. It is within the environment of a safe, affordable and secure home that children will thrive. That basic truth is self-evident. But when these criteria that I have above outlined, SAS, are under assault, a child's ability to thrive and achieve their potential is plainly put at risk. On behalf of the Child Poverty Action Group that I represent today, I want to put four pegs or PO in the ground. One, access to safe, affordable and secure housing is a child's fundamental birthright not a matter of privilege, patronage, charity or, dis or discretion. Two, the state is both the guardian and the guarantor of that right. Three, the state-sponsored policy settings over the last 35 years have caused the denial of equal opportunities to families, that is children, to access and implement that right I have outlined. Four, the state has a compelling obligation and opportunity to now remedy its entrenched and dismal failure to ensure this right is affected over these last 35 years. I mention opportunity. What of opportunity? In my view, COVID events and the range of fiscal responsibilities that have arisen demonstrate three truths, or if you wish, three new lenses through which we now view the world. Firstly, the state, not the marketplace, in my view, will be the dominant force in economic matters into the near and foreseeable future. Secondly, the money to do things, 
can be found or generated. It is how we order our spending priorities. Thirdly, primarily what we do or don't do is a matter of political will or leadership. Put another way, I pose the question, does our leadership have the kahunas to reverse those policy settings that have, been dis that have seen disproportionate wealth, goodies if you like, cascade down upon and accumulating to the rich end of town while creating ever greater inequality with, with an ever increasing majority of the community at the other end of town. In the few remaining minutes I have, I pose, the question, I pose a question and hopefully provide an answer. The question I pose is, has COVID revealed anything about the state and its willingness to engage with S, the provision of SAS, safe, affordable and secure housing? In my view, the answer to that is yes, there has been an example. Might, you might rightly say, was what, what, when and where did this happen? I saw that there was a road to Damascus moment for the state when it came to the provision of housing to the homeless of Aotearoa when level four was imposed. You might rightly say, well, explain what you mean. I set out seven matters for consideration and my next observations arising from these seven points arise from a purpose-directed interview I had with the city missioner of Auckland, Chris Farrelly. He reports and observes, and I re reflect his words here, within three days of level four being imposed, approximately 1,000 homeless persons, clientele I call, in Auckland alone were given placements in either motels or backpacker accommodation. Not ideal, not long term, but effectively affordable and a, and a response in the circumstances. And that initiative essentially remains effective today, with, essentially, with approximately 90% of the clientele placed, elected to remain in settled accommodation. The city missioner advised that the placement has allowed caseworkers and health professionals to offer wraparound services to monitor in particular the health, the health and in particular the mental health issues of that clientele. Some people for the first time have come into the system and have had access to health and other welfare entitlements that is their due as members of the team. Fourthly, he and caseworkers report that settlement and stability has produced clearly discernible improvements to the lives and well-being of this clientele. Fifthly, the clientele dress differently, they interact differently, and their measure of self-esteem has grown significantly. And can I digress for a moment and tell the story as he re relates it to me of Auckland's most long-standing homeless person of some 22 years standing was somewhat reluctant to leave the streets when COVID-4 came along, but he was encouraged to do so. He set a reasonably uh, challenging price in the sense that he said, I, I need to have a view of the city that I have for my setting. And, uh, and so he was granted that. I am told that he keeps the place immaculately and for the first time in 22 years, he has got on a bus and visited his family in Taranaki. Sixthly, sixthly, police, corrections and health agency all report an upside. Less trouble on the streets, less presentations, less presentations of homeless persons at, emergency, at the emergency department of Auckland Hospital. My final point that uh, Chris Farrelly discussed with me is that it is estimated it presently costs taxpayers on average 
$65,000 per year for each person who goes homeless. It's made up of the health costs, police, justice and benefit costs versus the comparative cost of approximately $20,000 per year to house a homeless person and provide a first level of wraparound support. Those figures, the, so the source of those figures that I quote, come from the University of Otago research directed into the Housing First programme being run by the People's Project in Hamilton. And full publication of the research results will emerge later this year. Not many children, you might say, at least of a tender age, feature in the homeless statistics. But a family now, and there are many of them, under severe economic and social pressures, is the, set, is the setting for the future homeless clientele to emerge. Our team of five million appear to be capable of staunching this injury that I've described above. Plainly, it would be obscene, or at least indecent, to contemplate the outcomes, the outcomes, the, out, the outcome of turning off the tap that has achieved this partial success so far in addressing the issue of homelessness. The political and moral optics would be appalling. In our team of five, if our team of five million can staunch this level of injury, we can surely tackle the present and creeping cancer of our dysfunctional housing market that is anything but safe, affordable and secure. To blend the words of our respected Prime Minister and our foremost City Missioner, Chris Farrelly, if you treat people under housing stress with kindness and allow them to conduct their home lives with dignity, the economic and social outcomes will surely justify the housing investment. Thank you. Thank you.